okay, there is nothing like talking to somebody, a blast from the past where we were both in Hong Kong, where we were young and single and free and like the world was in front of us. I'm talking about being maybe there's a small group of us who were so-called Asian American coming to Hong Kong to develop a, uh, a career in the movie business, right? There were really only just a handful of us. So here I've got very, very special time to recap with David Wu, who is Asian American, who made his legacy in Hong Kong and Taiwan, living still in Taiwan now. And he's just as old as me or as young as me. So David, welcome to Quark Talk. Hey, Crystal, long time no see. How are you doing, man? <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's full of smiles because when we first went to the to Hong Kong, we were really, right? Just fresh out of college. Um, this is messed up, dude. I mean, this is totally messed up. I mean, imagine all the stuff we're talking about is literally 30 years ago. Okay. Right. Now, you, and well, now. 30, 30 plus, 35 years ago. Okay, what year did you go to Hong Kong? I uh, went to Hong Kong in 1989. Same. I didn't know it in 89, 89 and then yeah. started the film business, Hong Kong film business in 89. Actually, I was going in, I was actually in college, graduated in 88, 89, and right after I was done uh, at, at the university, uh, they go, hey, you want to go do a film in Hong Kong? I go, sure. Maybe I, I figured I'd go for like, you know, like one film and then go back to Seattle and then try to get a job at, you know, North Nordstrom's or something. And then all of a sudden, like, the, uh, during, you know that during the 90s, like late, uh, early 90s in Hong Kong, there was a lot of things being shot. So basically one thing led to another, to another, yes. to another, and never left. It was a scene, right? Time. It was the golden era of the film industry. Hong Kong was thriving. The whole economy was like, it was so exciting, right? It was, it was very exciting. Uh, in the city, it was very exciting. It's kind of a, I don't know, the weather is kind of a mess. <laughs> okay. so basically everything was happening. It was, everything was blooming. Everything was happening. Like I say, it was the heyday of yeah. Hong Kong filmmaking for us anyway. Yeah, you know, but what I wanted to do is to compare kind of like our both of our experiences going there, because, you know, for me, I see it from the woman's perspective. Like I saw how how patriarchal, how like, math, you know, women weren't allowed to sit on the camera boxes. I bet you didn't even know that. Of course I knew that. What do you mean I didn't know that? Well, we I get to sit on it. He told me because, oh, you're a good guy. You can sit on the day. But I'm like, thank yeah. you very much. I go, people can't sit on it. You know why? Because it's bad luck. Yeah. So what do you think about that sexism here in Asia? I wouldn't call that sexism. I think it's kind of more like a, like a belief, right? I mean, for example, guys can't touch certain things. Girls can't touch certain things. I think it's one of the things. They're not against women. They're saying, like, you know, it's one of those little, I guess, uh, uh, industrial. Like, but, and, hey, this is not the film industry. This is like the camera crew. Okay. Yeah, it's tra this traditional old, old thinking, like superstitions. Well, they got certain sort of superstitions, like, you know, you don't, don't do certain things at certain times, whatever it is. And I, I, I mean... Obviously, Asia is kind of like like men oriented more so than women oriented, right? Right. In yeah. general, yeah. So, so maybe that's just I don't know. Maybe that's an excuse to to talk to women. I don't know. But <laughs> in a way, you can't sit on the why is a way to break the ice. I guess I don't know. <laughs> when you think about the roles, like you played a lot of interesting roles. You got to play like the 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 the, the pretty boy. You know, you got to play like the the nice handsome um, boyfriend guy. You all you went there and you got to work with all these big stars. How did that make, you know, you're kind of like just a local boy from Seattle growing up, right? I mean, even though you grew up in, you were born in Taiwan, right? I was born in Boston. Oh, you were, that <laughs> shows how much research I, didn't I know that either. I swear <laughs> I found that on Wikipedia, it said you were born in Taiwan. <laughs> There's a lot of different, okay, my life was actually complicated. I was like born in near, okay, actually not Boston, it's near Boston, a small town called Southbridge. And then when I was two, because of my dad's job, we moved back to tai, tai, Taipei. And then went to school in Taipei till the end of uh, elementary school, which is like 1979. Then because of my dad's work again, and then the whole family moved back to the, to, move to North America and then uh, went to Seattle because my mom had his, uh, had her uh, brother there. So, you know, we had okay. people to watch after us anyway. So anyway, so we we'll stayed there until end of college. And then eventually they go, hey, you want to come to Hong Kong and do it or whatever film? Because I... Kind of got into film business in uh, what junior year of my college, you know, junior year of my college days, whatever. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, ended up going to Hong Kong in '89, and then stayed in Asia ever since, basically. So you had no idea that was going to be the catapult of your career. You're as no, you... of course not. I did, didn't really know because I thought I was going to go there for like one project and then come back to go back to Seattle. And like I said, get a job at Nordstrom's right. or get a job at Starbucks. Yeah, yeah. You're going to exist in Starbucks. But you ended up staying. You never really moved back to the states. 
No, technically, technically, no, not at all. You know, my, my family's still Mexican. You're perceived as very American, right? So do you still feel that way? Do you still feel more American or do you feel more Asian? Like you've been in Asia for so long. Is it? I think, I think my downfall is kind of like the, I'm, ne- I'm got tweener, you know what I'm saying? Like even till today, like this. Kind of... We're crossing in between spaces, right? Well, I mean, you know, at our age, I try to do like, like whatever is kind of, I don't want to say late, but they're kind of like on the delayed side, right? Because back in the days, they can't look at you because, Look, 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 okay, honestly, we're going to talk and focus on the Asian Americans work, work in the Hong Kong heydays. Look, okay, we go back to what we were talking about. We had, who was before us? Okay, before me was Michael Wong, okay? Yeah. Michael and, Wong, Russell. Yeah, yeah. Right, and then, so, so basically, I, I only, who, who was, like, the first Asian American who worked in Hong Kong? Okay, a lot of people probably didn't know, like, for example, like, when I was uh, doing some films, I started meeting a lot of people. You start realizing a lot of people had these so-called uh, Western education background. For example, I, was, I went to a set one day. Honestly, I didn't know anything. I mean, I didn't know anything at all. That's why we were kind of—I don't want to say outcast, but we kind of we us Asian sure. we were like the blended. thing that they called, you know, yeah. They guy up the way too, yeah. Yeah, they always see us then, almost not a perpetual foreigner like they do in the states, but we're always like, oh, the guy died, guy moy. Like we, we either got away with something, or that was the excuse for us doing something wrong, or something. Yeah, we got away with a lot of stuff, but yeah. we did really get into a lot of stuff because of that, also, right? So people yeah. say like, Americans are kind of fun, whatever. Yes, but in career wise, it was no help, honestly. Except the fact that you speak English, you could probably do what? Do MTV? I mean, come on, okay. <laughs> that's but like, that was your ticket yeah. to fame, though, right? Kind of like the whole woman thing on Channel V and all that was like your legacy. I don't know if it, I don't know about you, but like uh, in terms of my life, I think I kind of I just kind of started doing things that went along. I never really had a knowledge of planning my career, so to speak. Yeah. So it's kind of like not very good. If I could do everything all over again, I'd do it a whole different way. I will plan something, stick to something as opposed to just kind of take it along as it comes along. They take whatever as it comes along. Yeah. And then and then not going to that quite problem so often, you know, <laughs> well, stuff like that. <laughs> that came with the package. Come on. Of course, but then again, it's like a lot of fun. I, I, I don't take nothing away from it. A lot of fun in terms of career-wise. Yeah. It, 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 it doesn't really, you can't, you can't focus. And the, fa- the fact is, I was never a professional actor in a sense. Right. And you didn't do like martial arts training, right? You didn't do any of that. Sure. Training. That's, that's what they should have done, right? The three things I should have done when I was growing up that come, you know, in retrospect. One is learn guitar. One is learn kung fu. And one is singing. Okay, three things in terms of like, the entertainment business. That's what okay. I would have learned. Interesting. You know, then... Probably the next, the, the jet, it would have been me. Who knows, right? Right, Or right. Robin. Another way, yeah. Robin. Or I remember that guy. <laughs> Robin? Wow. Yeah, he's in LA. I still keep a touch with the boy. Yeah, his name is Sawin. Well, Robin Shu. If yeah, so what happened? I made a film with you. We were in China. I don't even know that copy of it. Like, but yeah. So there are a lot of potential with people who came over, but then like, VHS. huh? what you say? The VHS. <laughs> The videotape version as opposed to the DVD. It was one of those low budget things. I don't remember. But so the point is like there were a lot of opportunities to do things. But then do you think because of being the Americanized identity that we would you would never be able to really kind of break through the industry? You think that was a reason? I go through your own way. No, I don't think it's really a, a, a an issue. I think what what restricted me anyways because i did for honestly i didn't know we didn't know how to play that game especially like coming like like uh, coming in from america like oh we're, we're not like used to the, the asian way of like uh, mingling yeah you know 20. yeah yeah and all, all that stuff drink is fun but we drink for fun right we go out to a bar we're like yeah. we're kind of yeah. hang out with english yeah. people yeah they're really my story with the you know like kind of hang out with the with the local with the quote unquote the local film industry yeah people. yeah i hear you because they want to keep their careers going yeah, yeah. Yeah. How to play that game. We didn't know how to play that game. I remember when I first went over, my uh, somebody told me, you have to remember how to play, you have to know how to play the game. And I never learned that. I didn't know what it meant. Like you said. I, I didn't either. We're just on the same boat. I never yeah. knew how to play. A lot of people didn't know how to play the game either. Look at, look at, look at, look at back at things. Let's go back again. Let's, let's mention all the people that probably, who, a lot of people don't know, uh, who Try. don't really, who came from, from the, from the, from the States, I guess. Look at, look at Michael Z, Eric Michael Z. Yeah. His wife is being not you know, I did a, I did an RTHK program with him. I saw it like, like just recently and it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. We, what would have happened? Two days ago, I'm in Taipei watching TV. I saw your movie with Jackie Chan. Which one? Uh, uh, Beetle Mountain. 
Hey, you're the lawyer. Yeah, that was my first film. Yeah, you're the lawyer. I go, wait a minute. I just spoke to her like two days ago. And then blah, blah, blah. Like, Whoa, what a, you know, it was like meant to be it. Okay, but can I throw in the sexism part again then? Because the difference between like when you enter it, you might not have to be playing these certain roles. Like, well, for me, for that film, they made me like wear this mini skirt and like, I'm a lawyer. I'm not supposed to be looking like this. And I have to question and challenge these things until I complain. And then Jackie said, okay, give her another look. So they gave me glasses and like a long skirt after I complained. But you've never had the experiences like of of that kind of like trying to put you in a certain image, right? You didn't have to. Did, did you play oh, uh, certain in, things? In terms of that, I think uh, no. You're right. As a guy, they kind of you know they go, oh, if I if I made a mistake, if I didn't know how to do something right, they go, oh, like, he's like, he's like, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so they kind of kind of like kind of forgive you. They don't really give you any crap, right? Right. But then again, like other people who local ones do something wrong, they start yelling at them and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yes, you're right. You've got a lot of stuff. But for girls, even back then, especially from, uh, they, they, they found the way I look at it, it's like they find these Asian American girls or whatever, or, or you know, for like girls from like overseas coming back to be in the film business. Like find it very and, uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, you, Noni. Yeah. Noni. Yeah. Noni. And uh, what's her face? A Francoise. Oh, wow. Yes. Right. And yeah. this is actually yeah. they wanted her to sign and like take her clothes off and everything, and then she, yeah, she had all these issues. Yeah, because they, they, they figure they, the way they, they, the way they understand or understood uh, Western females that they're very open. Yeah, yeah. Them a whole longer, man. Yeah, right? Aren't you very open? You know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Well, yeah, we're open in terms of our our, our, our mouths. <laughs> yeah, in terms of like the the, our, the, the scope of our, our attitude and everything, but not like open as like you know what I'm. From, I can do I'm anything. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what they think, but yeah. It's that's true. Not what we think. Yeah. <laughs> but just like, but, then, yeah. And like, yeah. So those are some of my struggles. But like for you, I feel like as an Asian American guy in the Asian industry, you almost don't pose a threat to the Asians, like Asian men, because you're different. Like they won't see you as kind of competing with them in the same way. Do you feel that way? Like they, they think you're like this out of town who's just in here for like a, you know, like a little thing, but you get until you actually do something that's very serious, which I never got, you know, just call it the stroke of the luck, whatever. And then just kind of roles got really, honestly, back, honestly, back in the nineties, the Hong Kong film industry was like really, really hustling, hustling and hustle and bustle, hustling and bustling. Yeah. That's in English. Anyway, but then again, if you look at the quality of it, it just wasn't very good. Right. And then in fact, somebody. I remember I keep telling my friends this, like, uh, they go, well, what about the Hong Kong days, you know, la da di da da And I go, well, there was this one scriptwriter one day very proudly to me, like, to write a script that's three and a half days. And I looked at him kind of like this, like, okay, shall we move that film? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who would boast being able to write a script for three and a half days? Well, you know, you know, Chang Cheng Yuling boasted for making nine films at the same time. So everything was about quantity, not quality, right? That was Hong Kong. Well, back in the days, it was. That's good. I mean, when they say like the market went sour, they go, oh, the market is bad. I goes, no, man, because eventually the market, of course, people with their, with their, you know, like, what do you call that? Like, uh, uh the, their, their expendable cash, or whatever, excess cash. If they want to watch a film, they're going to be choosing as opposed, choosing two out of 10, as opposed to six out of 10, right? If you have like a bad film, no one's going to watch it. They blame it on the market being bad. I think it's people being smarter, where they actually spend their money. That's but how didn't you grow it. up watching Chinese films? When I was in China, growing up in the States, I grew up watching Kung Fu films. I went with my dad to Chinatown and watched all those. Yeah. The difference is kind of like American cars, okay? American cars were good in the 60s, kind of weird in the 70s and 80s, like really bad in the 80s. They kind of got worse in the 70s, got really, really terrible in the 80s. Starting the 90s, got better, okay? Because you realize what they were doing wrong. That's how I kind of compare it, okay? If you look at Hong Kong films back in the 60s, 70s, have all these like martial arts and kung fu theater kind of stuff. Yeah. They had the character. Right, so like Jiang Da Wei, yeah, you know, like yeah, uh, least, uh, right, as they like, uh, right, the the kung fu stuff, and they cook, all the yeah, all the kung fu yeah, sides, yeah, and then uh, uh, Wang Yu, yeah, all the martial yeah. arts, yeah, like, yeah, the Siu Lao Ti, all that stuff, you know, Sha Nu, you went like uh, wasn't Khan, it was like some film festival overseas, anyway. Yeah. So it was like you know back then they had the yeah. character, right? right? But somehow, because get you know, if you look at the 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 early eighties seventies you look at the Hoi brothers yeah uh, Hoi Gun Ki right Sam Hoi Michael Hoi Ricky Hoi their stuff was was really good yeah their stuff was really good they had their their and the Bruce Lee stuff the Hoi brothers stuff that was the back in the heydays of the the the, the Golden Harvest 
those stuff was actually really good. Yeah. They had their meaning, right. had their storyline, the message behind the movies. As it gets to like the 80s, 90s, you tell me what message were they trying to send. I can't see it. hardly any message in the movie except, no. hey, Crystal, take your shirt off. Yeah. You know? It was all just <laughs> like fat, well, fine thing. It was, it was just out. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. But then it thrived in its own way. It was part of that era. It reflected that type of energy in Hong Kong, right? So maybe everybody wanted to do something quick and then get something done. I mean, I think it happens everywhere, right? All yeah. of a sudden you see like a big market going. You want to get in there as soon as possible. Yeah. So you kind of neglect it on trying to make it good and kind of... Get like, quality. It would just copy yeah, something good, good and then make a, a bad version yeah. of it. But, but if you look at the... the you movie have a couple of quality films. Look at... How did you end up... You know, you've got the Farewell, My Concubine, right? I won't be gay. I was, the, I was the American kid again, so to speak, right? Yeah, but you played a local Chinese soldier. Like, how how does that work? You know? That was really pretty. Yeah, okay, this is not Leslie Jones. This is not Jungle Wayne, but this is like Zhang Tongyi, right? He's a really funny guy. Very nice guy. Friendly yeah. guy, night guy, very serious about his work, you know. So yeah. and he became popular and famous for like you know for like very good reasons. Right, and right, I, right. But then, so you know, your acting career going to do something like that and playing a a a, a red guard, <laughs> which is kind of funny because you're so like opposite of who you are. Exactly. That's why the Wu Douyin, the the assistant director, the AD, he goes, "Now, yeah, this, I know, ah, you understand, right? No problem, I'll teach you, ah." So, not the 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 cell I was supposed to carry, right? Yeah. Put it close to your heart and then wave it as you walk down the street. So you just gotta mimic what he did. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then they go and they ah, he's shang ah, this what 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 what. They go wow, he looks so much like the role. You really fit the role, blah blah blah. And I looked at myself. I go, I don't fit that at all, man. I look like a like <laughs> like 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 extra, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Anyway, it, it's just one of those things that uh, it it it. it, it is this good experience? But, you know, it, I mean, yeah. It, it wasn't, yeah. It was just like you're just doing it or whatever. It wasn't you. But do you feel like when you went into like Channel V and that whole era of the Wu Man show, that was kind of like you actually got, you know, you got your character out. You had more control over who you were. Like, how was that? Yeah, show? So people actually, so people happened? actually remember me because of the MTV. Remember the MTV days when they first came to Asia and Hong Kong back? Yeah. Back remember? Back. Okay, wait. Don't you remember my friend's no, home? No, wait. wait. Do you remember Tom Barnes? Of course. You know he was my old boyfriend, right? Yes. <laughs> and he's the one who started What's your point? Anyway, yeah, you guys were like your first VJ. Well, you started with MTV. I think like uh, the, the whole MTV kind of thing, kind of like, see? I, 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 hang on. You have a picture of the MTV day. Well, so what year did you start MTV? 92. Channel V days, but that was MTV. See, this is me and Michelle Kulan hosting one of the award shows that we had on Channel V. Okay. So the, See, we had the, the so-called the, the Wu Man show back in the days, right? Wait, what year did like, Wu Man show start? See, okay, if you if you remember, MTV started in 1991, and then we all went and casted for it. And like even Michael Wong did, everybody, anybody who had an Asian face that spoke English went and casted for it, right? Yeah. And then the only person they picked was Noni. Yeah, she was from Xi'an, right? She was the iconic, so was, yeah. Iconic what? Iconic DJ. I have friends who went, oh my God, that's DJ Noni. Like, you know. It just she has. She was like she was one of the rare Asian in 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 the cheerleading squad for Pac-10 oh. for the University of Washington. Wait, you guys went to school together, right? That's crazy. She was above me. Okay, but still, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, she she cracked it. She she was a boundary breaker, like in in the MTV scene. Right? Yeah, so basically, she was the first VJ hired in Asia by MTV, right? Right. right. So I didn't get picked. I didn't get picked, right? Yeah. It wasn't huh? like a year year and a half later maybe like 92 i think if i remember correctly i was like got a call from like uh uh don remember don don atio the gm back yeah. in the day yeah yeah it's really f hello hello dave you know, i go yes <laughs> right, who's it? this is don from mtv i go hi how are you doing are you still interested in being a vj i go sure whatever pays i guess <laughs> goes, can you come on wednesday and let's talk fruitfully <laughs> sure I still remember the conversation. I hung up the phone with mm. Wednesday. Yeah. And then literally tore a piece of paper off the side of a scrap paper that you had on the side. Yeah. And this rope was, I need this much. How about that? Or this piece of scrap paper. And I they go, didn't even have to interview you for anything. Like they were just going to tick you for your personality and then create something around that. Right? Ah, that's another story. That's that good. You only have half an hour. I can talk. I have like five minutes left. Yeah. Anyway, so basically, make a long story short, 
you know, get there started. First thing I did, if I could find the picture, if I could find the picture. No, 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 Ling, you got five minutes here. We wouldn't go. While you're looking for it, whose idea was it to create the Wu Man show? Like, how? It was kind of like one idea. Okay, Wu Man was my name because uh, back at elementary school, all the Western or Caucasian kids would say, hey, you're Wu, Wu, Wu Man, Wu Man. Okay, so the Wu Man kind of stick when I was a kid going to school in, 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 in Taipei, right? Yeah. And they go to a medical school in Taipei anyway. So, so uh, that, that's what it stuck. And then basically uh, went there and goes, hey, let's do something called the Wu Man Show. And they kind of stuck and they go, found it. Anyway, so went to MTV, started, and then they go, hey, can you go to Singapore Friday? I, I started Wednesday, like two days later, I'm going to go to Singapore. I never owed anything in my life to interview this guy, Ryan Adams. Oh my gosh. Wow. And you guys have no idea, like what you're, okay. This is 92. Like, literally, 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 literally three days after I was hired, I got sent to Singapore to shoot this kind of stuff. Wow. Okay. So that opened up a whole new window, whole new kind of like gateway into possibilities, right? As a TV presenter, as, because then you had like a whole like, you know, long running legacy of being able to run, host your show. Uh, basically, so three years, uh, three years in MTV. So they say like, there's something, did they actually work around our character? No. Basically, they gave us a space. They go, okay, record this. We call it links. You like a show, we introduce music videos back in the days, right? Very common. Yeah. Oh, the new song by, you know, uh, so-and-so, so-and-so, yeah. like Brian Ant, you know, came out, blah, 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 about the da-da-da-da-da. Let's take a look, okay? So, it, mm -hmm. boom, they go to video, right? So, basically, they just record, and producers back in the days didn't give a hoot what you did on camera. And then back, I was just talking to our friends yesterday. They said, oh, my God, I love Channel Me and everything. But the funny thing is, like, oh, you guys have such good character and everything. The truth is, we're recording. I go, you know what? I think I flubbed up on uh, one of the lines. And the producer said, ah, forget it. I've got to get out of here. Let's just go on and continue to the next link. So we just didn't give a hoot about what happened in between. If it wasn't that terrible, it just let it slide. That in itself created a character, if you know what I mean. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. So it was by, by mistake, the character came out. Ah, you're like, I need to do something. I got to. We... Everybody just want to get out of the office quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, but it was very um, impressive to do your, yeah, even in my, now I can still imagine going, E-R, Sad, Su, was that how you did it? That was, that, that was uh, the little promo that we actually did for the, for the program. That was Channel V. Yeah, Years but... later, MTV became Channel V. So, right. yeah, and then the whole focus was kind of the yeah, different section of the, the music channel, like the Mandarin-speaking version. You've got the, the Hindi version. Right. Different area. But then that's how you're able to brand yourself as being kind of like this Western Chi Chinese American and yet speaking fluent Chinese and being able to mix all these elements together for a show that represented you and you had the platform and the voice, right? Yeah, hopefully I can still do that now because uh, I think it's kind of fun. And it actually, my dream thing is to do like a talk show, like a, like a, like kind of a Jimmy Fallon type, type talk yeah. show kind of yeah. stuff. In Taiwan? But, you know, uh, anywhere. It's just nobody really understood what I was trying to do. But anyway, hopefully. Now with the magic of internet, like this kind of stuff. Yeah. Like I'm probably something, you know, so you should yeah. do something too. You well, that's one thing. I can't shut up. I kind of feel, I feel like I still need a platform to talk about because there's always going to be issues, social issues, and really interesting kind of transnational Asian, Asian related issues that people don't ever really kind of put out there. Oh, lots, lots, lots. I, you know, I, like, I like to talk about that kind of too, like stuff too, like including sports, you know, stuff like you know, where I'm living around where we're living, issues, like, you know, whatever, but. You gotta find the right time, the right place to do that kind of stuff. So uh, if you have some some good platform, let me know. Well, <laughs> tell me, like, tell me in the last couple of minutes of this thing is like where you are at today, and you just mentioned a little bit of like what you kind of aspire to want to still do, which I'm glad to hear. Yeah. So right now, basically, after uh, I use a lot of basically stuff anyway. So after COVID, I've uh, been in Taipei for more time than before, watching the kid grow up. Yes. Yeah, so how old is your daughter now? Four. People call her my granddaughter. Isn't that terrible? Because <laughs> yeah, my kids are all like adults now, you know. Like I know. <laughs> my kids but see, that's the difference Love again it. between male and female. We need to do that earlier. You can get married later. You can still like go and have like three year old girlfriend. And still have one of you. So you look all right. You look <laughs> happy. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <Yeah. laughs> you know. So hopefully. Hopefully, uh, through the magic of the internet now, we're trying to do something we want to do where other people don't, because they don't understand what you want to do. They can't really create something for you because they don't know what the hell you want to do. So you have to do something yourself. They're trying yeah. to find, at this age, you're trying to find your own, like you say, platform.
to really do what you want to do yeah. all and of your there's life. There's a lack of content created by, I hate to say we're middle-aged, but middle-aged um, personalities who are out there embracing like social issues or whatever it is around us, right? Yeah. That or food. I'm actually shooting something. Remember Dr. Ho? Total food. I remember we used to go to this one restaurant in Hong Kong that if you eat the whole 40 ounce of steak, you get it free. Do you remember that? Austonian. That's it. Yes. That's it. And you, Piglet, you would be able to scarf down that 40 ounce steak. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, very, very easily. Very easily. Right now, I'm kind of like too old for that kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah. Food is your thing. <laughs> yeah. So then you're, yeah. Okay. So that's something you want to do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, food. So I've actually was shooting something with, uh, with, with my friend, you know, Dr. Ho, who's actually on the side from being a chiropractor, kind of want to do it, this, uh, video stuff. So we actually did one season. He has a program called Day in Van on YouTube and stuff. And one called okay. Eat with Dave. So if you, oh. if you have a chance, eat you're going to, yeah. Okay. Eat with, yeah. Eat with Dave. E-A-T-W-I-T-H-D-A-V-E. Okay. Yeah. Or David. Oh. Dave. Anyway, something like that. So we're going to do something like that's one first season, so to speak. And then we're trying to. He goes, oh, I guess the response is not bad. So we're going to try to do the Good. second one. I'm so yeah, glad to hear that there are opportunities and you're embracing like new things and there's not like, okay, I've got a we have to have to we have a season. Do, don't, you, don't you own like a bar or something like that? You could still do businesses, but you don't, you know, most side. Like, they've got money. See, Tina Dalo, you go broke doing restaurant nowadays, especially. Well, it's not like uh, YouTubers. You're going to have to be like an influencer, like all those 20 year olds then. But you know, you yeah, have a lot still. You still have a lot of energy. Nothing's really changed, but you just have a, like, I can't still see you as a death. But you know, um, it's interesting. We have this legacy and you have a history, but you're going forward and doing like, still breaking new grounds, right? In your phase in life right now. Well, I gotta try. I think the, the, the biggest danger nowadays is if you don't embrace the, the progress of technology, right? And then, you know, like, like I'm already, Delayed. I'm already late on this kind of stuff. They go, oh, what about your Facebook? I go, I don't even touch that. Instagram? Huh? You know, stuff like that. So I got to. You just got to, yeah. Get motivated. It. Yes. Got to be motivated. Get, get with it. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it sounds all great. Sure. So if you have one thing to tell our people who haven't heard from you for like decades, like what do you want to say to people? I'm still alive, people, man. And then uh, I had that journal. And then uh, hopefully I want to get back into films because I yeah. love films. Yeah, okay. Do some fun. Especially now in Taipei, like a lot of people are talking to, and hopefully something comes about. We can do something that back in the Hong Kong days, I've never yes, tried. Actually, I want to do they something don't understand about that too. Comedy. They think, uh, if you have some, let me know. If I have some, I was allowed to let you. Do. Yeah. We'll let you play a lawyer again. <laughs> with, with, with like clothes on. Yeah. With long skirts. Anyway, Please. thank you so much. This was David Wu having a blast talking about the past 1990s till today. And wow, you know, and a lot to go forward with. So excellent. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, woman. Thank you, man. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, Please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.